God is good, amen? Man, it's good to just worship the Lord together. Let's never take that for granted. The blessing and the privilege it is for us to gather together like this and uh, worship with family, because that's what we are, right? We're family, so we thank God for that. Well, I heard this story about a 90-year-old couple, and they were sitting on the front porch one evening, and the husband was overcome with the romanticism of the evening, and he turned and looked at his wife, who was quite hard of hearing, and he said to her, I'm proud of you. To which she replied, hey? So then he looked at her again, and with affection, he said, I'm proud of you. And she said, yeah, well, I'm tired of you too. You know, sometimes the more familiar you become with something, the less fascination you have with it. Have you noticed that? I mean, if we were really truthful with ourselves, we'd have to admit that we get tired of things pretty quickly. Uh, The thing that you gain or the thing that you recognize at first that has energy and excitement for you, pretty quickly you lose admiration for or interest in. Right, take that album that you downloaded and you play it like crazy for the first month or so, but then after that, it just takes up storage space and hardly gets any play time. Or the restaurant that you find where you love, you know, their gelato or that appetizer, that perfect entree, and you tell all your friends about it and you go to this restaurant, but then you start looking for another restaurant to go to, right? I mean, even a a new car to you loses its newness after six months or so, and you see other cars that you like better on the road. We have this saying in our culture, familiarity breeds contempt. And while I think contempt might be too strong a word there, that certainly we'd have to admit and agree that familiarity breeds indifference. That often the more familiar you become with something, the less fascination you have with it. And I think that that's happened to many of us as it relates to Christmas time. That we've just become so familiar with Christmas time that we have less fascination with it now than we used to. Now, don't get me wrong, I think there are things that we love about Christmas and people love Christmas, but you know. There's things that we don't like about Christmas either, right? We don't like that it's getting cold out. We don't like the busyness of the season. Uh, Some people don't like, if you've lost a loved one, you understand it's difficult to go through Christmas season sometimes. Uh, We don't like how expensive the season is. I saw a sign in a store the other day that says, it's beginning to cost a lot like Christmas. Yeah, that kind of says it, doesn't it? I mean, you start buying all the gifts and the bills start racking up and there's things that about Christmas we don't like but most of us we love Christmas time we love this time of year people would say it's the most wonderful time of the year and in the process of loving Christmas there are things that we share there are shared experiences that bring that love and an admiration for Christmas time we love that store owners all play Christmas carols, we love decorations, and we love people lighting up their houses, and um, there's just some things about Christmas that, that are just Christmas, like the first time you see eggnog on the shelf at the store, right? You know it's Christmas time. There's just, it's just a Christmas thing. There's something wrong about drinking eggnog in the summer, right? It's a Christmas thing. Or the Christmas movies, like you're flipping around the channels on TV, you see your favorite Christmas movie, like the Charlie Brown Christmas or, you know, the Christmas story with Ralphie and the Ovaltine and the Red Bider BB gun. How many like that one, right? There's so many. uh, The Grinch, you stole Christmas, uh, you know, how about Elf? That movie is on TV like seven times a day right now. It is constantly on and it's very funny funny movie, or the classic Christmas movies, It's a Wonderful Life, right? There's, these are Christmas things, and we, we love it. But I want to suggest to you that the more familiar we've become with Christmas over the years, the less fascination we have with it. 
I think about Christmas morning. Like, although we, we really do like Christmas morning still, it probably doesn't have the same fascination or excitement for us as it once did. Or even think about buying Christmas gifts for people. Now it's about just fighting the stores and the parking lot and getting it checked off your list in the midst of all the other things that you've got to try to get done in this season. And it's lost its awe of, you know, really chasing that perfect gift for that perfect someone or or taking the time to make that gift for someone, although I have never done that in my life, I don't think. But there's just this, there's diff, it's different now. Even Christmas memories. Like, although we strive to create new memories in this season, it just seems like our old Christmas memories were somehow better. Often the more familiar you become with something, the less fascination you have with it. My fear is that that is not only true about Christmas time, but is true for us with the Christmas story. That we've heard this story so many times and so often that we've lost our fascination with it. We somehow have lost our wonder and awe of what occurred some 2,000 years ago when God himself was born of a virgin. The old, old story has become just that. The old, old story. We lost our sense of wonder and awe. I think we've not only lost our wonder and awe as it relates to the Christmas story, but just in life itself. A wonder and imagination are not something that we would characterize our life as containing. We like things figured out. We don't like the mysterious anymore. We don't like the wonder and the awe. And we like things packaged and in boxes and systems and answers. And we like to be able to figure things out and contain things and sort things out and step by step. And, you know, we're masters of the YouTube how-to video or the Google fix, right? We just, we're not comfortable when there's something that we can't quite explain. One of the dangers and the sad parts about losing our wonder and awe as Christians is that we forget that that is the basis for the beginning of our Christian life. That we forget that, that this whole journey and experience started for us with the mysterious, incredible, wonder-filled moment when God was born of a virgin 2,000 years ago. I mean, how could you figure that out? How can you explain that? And when we lose our wonder and awe for the adventure that God has called us to, our life becomes a list of do's and don'ts and becomes obligations and duty. The goal of the Christian life, the goal of life itself, is not to arrive at the end as safe and undisturbed as possible, consumed with the natural but to embrace and engage the wonder-filled adventure that God has for every one of us. And so our prayer this Christmas season is that we would rediscover the wonder, that we'd rediscover the wonder of the Christmas story, this old, old story, this familiar story that would reclaim its fascination to us, that we would hear the story as if for the first time that we would recognize this life that God has called us to, that it's a wonderful life. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles today to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26. And I'm going to read the announcement of the angel to Mary. And as I do, I want to encourage you to just imagine, let your imagination go and, and picture what that moment was like for Mary. Experience the emotions and hear this incredible announcement that had never been made to anyone ever before in history and has never been made again to anyone since. 
unique, mysterious wonder and awe goes into this surprising announcement from the angel to Mary. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Imagine what this moment was like for Mary. It was incredible. It's astounding. It's shocking. It's, it's wonderful. There's nothing quite like being completely unaware of what is really going on around you at any given moment, right? Right? And then trying to catch up and make sense of what's actually happening. I read this story from a a, a bagpiper. You don't really read many bagpiper stories, do you? But I read this story from a bagpiper, and it went like this. He said, as a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Now, I didn't know that that's what they called them when they play them, but they play many gigs. He said, I was asked one time by a funeral director to play a funeral service for a homeless man. This man had no friends or family, and so the service was going to take place in a pauper's cemetery in the back lot of Nova Scotia. And so he said, as I was driving there, I became lost. I don't know the backwoods country very well, and being a typical man, I didn't ask for directions. And uh, so I arrived an hour late. He said, when I got there, the funeral director was gone. The, there was no hearse inside. And so, so I got out of the car. I got my bagpipes. I walked over to the graveside. And when I looked in, I saw that the vault lid was already in place. So I didn't know what else to do. I just started to play. As I played, there was a crew of grave diggers there eating their lunch. And they put their lunch down. And they got up and they walked over and they stood there. And I played my heart and soul out for this homeless man. I played like I've never played before. And as I played Amazing Grace, the whole crew started to weep. They wept, and I wept, and we wept together. See, by the time I was finished, I packed up my bagpipes. I started to walk towards my car. When I heard one of the crew members say, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. There's nothing quite like not knowing exactly what is going on around you, right? And then trying to catch up and make sense of the whole thing. Could you imagine how Mary's feeling as this is going on? Have you ever had a surprise announcement to you where you're trying to figure out exactly, wait, what, what's going on here? Right, maybe, uh, maybe you've had a surprise job offer you weren't anticipating. Or maybe a surprise announcement of job loss. Maybe a diagnosis that you weren't expecting or anticipating. How did you feel in that moment? 
Or maybe someone showed up to surprise you that you weren't expecting, a long-lost friend or something. Or How many of you have ever had somebody throw you a surprise party of some kind? What's that moment like? It's a little weird, isn't it? You're trying to figure out, hey, whoa, 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 what's, time out, what's going on around here? You realize that there were conversations that included you that didn't include you leading up to that moment, right? Uh, two years ago, my wife uh, threw me a 40th surprise birthday party. And uh, I got to say, I had no idea what was going on up until the night of. Uh, as I was walking towards the venue, I was uh, pretty sure something was up, the place that we were at and, and why we were going there. And I was trying to figure it out. But until that time, I had no idea all of the clandestine conversations and the, you know, the private uh, things that were being made and put together. And so, so in that moment, I, I realized all of a sudden there were conversations that included me that did not include me. And that moment when 40 people yell surprise at you, it's a little weird. And then they're all standing looking at you expecting you to say something and you don't know what to say, right? I can appreciate why the Bible says Mary was disturbed and confused. She's trying to figure out what's going on. She realizes that there were some conversations going on in the Godhead that included her but didn't include her. And all of a sudden she's surprised in this moment. I want to tell you that there are moments, there are conversations that are happening in the Godhead right now about you that include you but don't include you. The Bible says that Jesus is forever making intercession with the Father. He is constantly talking about you. He is constantly talking about your situation. He's constantly talking about your future. And so it's surprising to us sometimes when these moments happen, these circumstances happen, these surprises happen in our life, and we're not totally ready for them. I want to warn you, don't be surprised if God surprises you. The things that God does are unpredictable. Writer Ecclesiastes 11.5 says this, Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. You can't figure God out. The writer here is looking at the imaginative, incredible creativity with which God has created the human body, life to produce life. And how it formed and shaped and developed the miracle of birth. We've become so familiar with birth, we've lost our fascination with it. It is an incredible creation that God has formed. And he's like, I, I can't get it, I don't understand it. God is, is amazing. Now, add to that, Mary is not only being told that she is pregnant by an angel, but the angel has said to her, oh yeah, by the way, this is the Son of God. And your pregnancy is by the Holy Spirit. This is be hard to understand, right? We can't fully grasp or understand the way God works and how God works and what he does. But think about when Jesus was on this earth, for example. Right? Jesus performed all these miracles, but he didn't do them in the same way all the time. He did them differently. Sometimes he just told the man to stretch out his hand and the man with a withered hand was healed. Sometimes he touched people like Malchus's ear and put his ear back on. Sometimes he, he healed people partially. Like there's a guy that was, he couldn't see and, and Jesus touched him and then he could see people but they looked like trees and then he touched him again and then he was completely whole. I mean, why would Jesus do that? It's hard to understand the way that God does things. We don't totally comprehend. I mean, one time he produces food for thousands of people out of thin air, and then he lets Martha and Mary duke it out in the kitchen preparing him a meal. I mean, it's just weird to think about, I mean, timing-wise, he waited as Lazarus was sick for three days until he died first, then raised him back to life. 
One time, he spit on the ground, made mud, put it on a guy's eyes, and told him to go jump on the lake. If you try to figure out why God does certain things, why God allows certain things and doesn't allow other things, you miss the point. The point is that God can do anything at any time in any way that he wants to. And Mary asks this question, understandably, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. This doesn't even make any sense. How can I sort it out? You know, there's this unpredictability as it relates to God. God does unexpectedly. He arrives unexpectedly. He is unpredictable. And from our perspective, there is a randomness to the way that God works. Have you ever asked this question of God? How can this happen? God, how can this happen? How can you let this happen to me? How can you not respond to this situation the way that I thought you would? God, how can this happen? How can you let it go so far? How can you let it go so long? God, how can this happen? It would be easy for Mary to make this statement. How can this happen? Why would God choose to do this? If you think about it, she's this teenage Palestinian girl, maybe 14, 15 years of age. You think God could find another more mature woman to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy, someone who can handle the emotions of the situation and the difficulty and the hardship that she was about to face. I mean, how do we understand God chose Mary Or the fact that God even chose Jesus to come as a baby. Like God could have just made Jesus appear as an adult, right? Fully formed and not have the humiliation of being a baby. Completely dependent upon human parents. This is God, right? Completely dependent upon human parents as a baby. It doesn't makes sense to us. We can't completely understand or comprehend why God does what he does and how God does what he does. And frankly, we don't like it very much. As often when we can't understand what God is doing or what God is not doing in our situation, it's expressed with frustration from us. God, how come you don't? God, why haven't you? I want to encourage you to embrace the wonder and the awe and the blessing of the unpredictability of God. The fact that you and I can't predict what God does and how God does it is an immense blessing in our lives. Friends, there is no prayer you can pray. You can't read the Bible enough to figure God out. You can't become a good enough Christian. You can't go to church enough to figure God out. And that is a good thing. Because if God was predictable, he would be subject to your circumstance. Think about it. If we were able to predict how God would work and what God would do in any given situation, then he would be limited in the way he would act in that situation. But I've got great news for you. God is not limited by your circumstance. He is Lord over your circumstance. The fact that you can't figure out what God is doing and how God is doing it in the midst of your situation should not bring us frustration, but should bring us comfort and faith in a God who's sovereign. Like the angel declared, for nothing is impossible with God. He is not subject in your circumstance. He is not limited by what anybody else says about what you're facing and going through. He is creator of heaven and earth. He is Lord over everything. And there is nothing, nothing, nothing that is impossible for him. He is God in your life. He is God over your circumstance. In fact, would you say that verse with me out loud? For nothing is impossible with God. Think about that situation that you've been walking through. Maybe that burden like Steve was talking about. Maybe 
maybe you've carried something for so long it feels impossible like anything could change. Or maybe you've been given a surprise announcement that you weren't anticipating and it's difficult. Think about those moments. Think about God who's sovereign. Let's say it again. For nothing is impossible with God. Yeah. In fact, would you do me a favor? Would you just close your eyes for a moment? I'm going to say it again. And I think we need to, we need to work at and train ourselves in rediscovering the wonder of God retraining ourselves to imagine his capacity and his supernatural ability in the midst of our lives. The Bible says that he can do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. So imagine your life, imagine your situation, dream with wonder and awe about what God could do. I'm going to say it again. For nothing is impossible with God. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what we need to reclaim. That's what we need to rediscover in our lives. You know, the challenge for us, friends, is this. We don't interpret our situations very well. What we often do is we cast shade on the immediate without seeing the ultimate. That, that we don't interpret our situations very well. We, we focus on our emotions. We focus on our hardships. We focus on our difficulties. We focus on what is and what is going on. And we don't see with faith the ultimate capacity or opportunity that God wants to work and do in our situation. We see the ultimate. We see the immediate, but God sees the ultimate God has a full perspective, the overarching view. I want to suggest to you that this news to Mary at first was not good news. This was challenging for her to hear. I mean, she was already betrothed. Let's understand that that means that she was committed to be married. A betrothal in that time and era was about a year long, and they were usually betrothed just shortly after puberty. So she would have been about you know, 14, 15 years of age. And betrothal happens when uh, families get together. There's an agreement. Usually uh, something of value is exchanged. And then there's commitments and expectations about how they're going to behave and operate and live. And one of those is fidelity, faithfulness. You're committed. And the fact that she is going to be pregnant would signal to everybody that she has been unfaithful. This is not good news to her. The punishment of that Old Testament law is death by stoning. That's not good news. Now, under Roman rule, that wasn't allowed to take place. So what would happen is certainly divorce, public shaming, incredible difficulty for her, her family, everyone involved. In the immediate, this was not good news. But ultimately, this was the best news for all of humankind. See, in the immediate, we we often struggle to see the ultimate. But God has the overarching view and we can trust in him. The fact that God would choose a teenage Palestinian girl to be born as the son of God is evidence of one of the most incredible things that God does. God most often ministers to people through people. The fact that he chose Mary to do this. The fact that he calls you and me to be the ones who bring this story to other people is is a wonder, is a mystery. It's incredible to me that God does that. The question is this. How will you and I respond to this surprise announcement? 
Mary responded like this, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. There's just this willingness and this openness to respond to what God has. All through history, people have responded in different ways to the surprising announcements of God. Uh, They've responded with skepticism, some have responded with fear, some with doubt, some with wonder and awe, some with accusation and ridicule, some with open-hearted trust, servants to follow the Lord. I was thinking about this surprise announcement of Jesus coming to earth, and it says, also the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. I was thinking about the surprise announcement of the Spirit coming on all people as well. There's different reactions to that moment. Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. The Bible says that there was people from all nations that were around hearing this phenomenon and their response is recorded in verse 12. And we hear all these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. People respond differently to the surprise announcements and the surprise working of God in this world. Some are amazed, some are perplexed, some question, some ridicule. Peter stood up and he began to explain that this was the gift that was promised by God of the Holy Spirit. And as he did, the Bible says that Peter's words pierced their heart. And they said to him and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? What should our response be? Peter replied, each of you must turn. Repent of your sins and turn to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children, even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. How do we respond to these surprise announcements of God? Will we respond with questions, confusion, doubt, hesitation? Will we respond with ridicule? Or will we respond like Mary, with wonder, but an open-hearted desire to receive whatever it is that God has for us? As Mary says, may everything you have said about me come true. You know, this surprise announcement of Jesus coming to the earth as a baby. And what that means for everyone, the announcement of salvation, the announcement of his grace to forgive us and cleanse us and change us. How will we respond? Will we say, may everything you've said come true? This surprise announcement of the Holy Spirit coming and being a gift that is promised. Listen, this promise is for you. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles and all who have been called by the Lord our God. Will we say like Mary, God, may everything you have promised come true. Everything that you have said about me come true in my life. Our prayer this Christmas season is that we would rediscover the wonder, the anticipation, the expectation of the supernatural work of God in our lives today. That we would anticipate that this God, who nothing is impossible for him, would speak to us 
would call us, would use us, would lead us, would guide us, would do something in us and through us this Christmas season. But make room for him to do it in his way and in his time. To this adventure, this truly wonderful life that he's called us to. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today as we, as we take a moment to respond to, to his word? I always want to create an opportunity for us every week. We, we respond to the word of God, and, and every week we create an opportunity for us to decide to make that decision to follow Jesus. Some here today, maybe this will be your first time putting your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've always thought God was real or believed in God, but want to really make that decision today to put your faith and trust in Jesus. And just as Peter explained to those who were there that day, that if we repent, we turn of our sins and we put our faith in Jesus, he cleanses us, he forgives us, he makes us new again. We always recognize though that this is not just a one-time decision. That decision to follow Jesus is a continual decision. It's one that we need to continue to make and remake over and over again not necessarily to receive salvation the first time, but, but to really be a follower of Jesus, to surrender like Mary and say, God, may everything that you said about me come true. May I live my life in a way that you desire. And so if you'd like to make that decision for the very first time, or you'd like to make that decision again, in a moment, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand. I won't embarrass you or have you stand up or come forward or anything like that. This is a private moment today uh, for you and at the end of the service we may have a response team member come and, and chat with you but if you would like to do that if you just say yeah Kevin I just I want to put my faith and, and trust in Jesus maybe for the first time or maybe you realize that you've lost your fascination with God and with Jesus you've lost your wonder and anticipation of him at work in your life and and you just want to reclaim that with a fresh commitment like Mary, an open-hearted surrender to him. So if that's you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just raise your hand? I'd like to acknowledge you and pray for you. Yes, God bless you. Yes, 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 God bless you. What else? Yes, God bless you. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Anyone in the balcony, you'd like to say, yeah, pastor, that's me. Thank you. Yes, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at the back, yes. Yeah. Let's pray. So Lord, you know everything. You see everything. You see our lives and our hearts and you have been leading us towards this moment when we didn't even really know it. Thank you that you've led people here to this place for this moment where they make this response. Lord, thank you. I praise you for that. Lord, I don't know the journey that everybody's been on in this room. I don't know the hardships and the circumstances, the questions, the frustration, the fear, the doubt, the anticipation, the hopes, the dreams. But God, you've heard every prayer. You've seen every cry and every desire. Help us to trust in you, our God. For those who made this decision for the first time, God, I thank you that your word promises that you cleanse us, you renew us, for those of us who are making this commitment again and saying, yeah, I, I lost the wonder somehow and I want to reignite that and, and trust in the supernatural work of God in my life. And I believe, God, that you're going to do something powerful in my life and through me. 
God, may there just be a rising tide of expectation, a rising tide of seeing your hand at work. God, may there be no inhibition in our lives, nothing that inhibits your work, your will, your way. May there be signs, wonders, miracles, words, your, your will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.